In Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, we encounter the reality that the gospel story has the power to transform every single aspect of our story. And that's exactly what we were made for. This is Ephesians in Word Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia. And you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. Father, today what we know not, will you please teach us? Namely, that you love us deeply. What we are not, please make us. Namely, people who have deep faith and knowledge and understanding of your love for us. And what we have not, please give us. And namely today, a, a deeper, wider, higher, longer understanding of, of your love for us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Start a little differently today. I want to review where we've been and where we're going in the book of Ephesians. I want us to see the way the book breaks down so we can make sense of of what's going on today. So, I mean, a lot some of that's a little bit hard to read, but I'll I'll read it for you. I I want to talk about the breakdown because Ephesians chapter four starts next week. We're closing out chapter three. We titled this sermon series intentionally, The Gospel Story Shaping Our Story. Because the book breaks down that way, really. Chapters 1 through 3 is the gospel story, and chapters 4 through 6 is how it's shaping our story. Another way to think about it are the words indicatives and imperatives. Now, those have grammatical definitions to them. Uh, I was terrible at at grammar in school, but indicatives are are statements that are are true. It's to 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 say an indicative is to to make a statement of of fact, statement of truth. And imperatives are things that are essential. It's like a command. If someone an imperative sentence is a sentence of of uh, of command expressing something that is that is necessary. We spent the first three chapters on the indicatives and by the way God or God does this a lot through scripture Paul the apostle does this a lot in his epistles very rarely does it break down quite as neat as it does in the first chapter of Ephesians or I mean the the book of Ephesians chapters one through three is full of indicatives things that are true about God things that are true about Jesus and and therefore things that are true about us because of Jesus I mean that's just a, a few of them That the gospel shapes today and tomorrow. The gospel provides for us an inheritance. It gives us peace. It inspires thankfulness in our hearts. These are things that become true about us because of the gospel. We are enlightened by the grace of God to see the truth of the gospel. We're filled to the point of overflowing with the fullness of God. We've received grace upon grace. We've received mercy. God's heart for us is to be near to us. We've been reconciled to each other. God saves us. God uses us. We saw that last week in the little font down there that you can probably not read, especially those of you that need glasses. But uh, it says we're, we're blessed, chosen, predestined, adopted, redeemed. We've been given wisdom and insight and workmanship. And that's just some of it. That's just some of what we've seen. So chapters one through three. Yes. Are there some imperatives in chapters one through three that we've seen? Things that we've been called to as the children of God? Yes. But it is heaviest with indicatives. It's heaviest with the information of the gospel story. But what's getting ready to happen in chapters 4 through 6 is we're going to see how it shapes our story. And we're going to encounter a boatload of imperatives. And by the end of those three chapters, we may find ourselves feeling overwhelmed. I can't be that kind of person. How can I possibly live like that? That's why the indicatives come first. We have to remember who we are in Christ. We have to remember who God says we are if we're ever going to be any of these other things. In the next few weeks, starting next week, we're going to be called to live in unity, to speak the truth in love, to speak kindly, to put off the old self, to put on the new self, to put away falsehood, to stop being sinfully angry, to imitate God, to walk in love, to practice sexual purity, to to, uh, refuse to covet, to be filled with the Spirit, to sing to one another. That's a good one. That'll be fun. To give thanks, to submit to one another, to love your wife like Jesus loves the church, to respect your husband, 
Those two alone, we're going to need help with both of those. To obey your parents, to serve others, to be strong, to put on the whole armor of God, to keep alert, to persevere, to pray for each other. And there's more in there, too. That's just scratching the surface. And the temptation will be to say, man, that's a long checklist. (laughs) I can't do all that. I've got the strength to do all that. You're right. You don't. I don't. I don't have the power to do all that. You're right. You don't. That's why the indicatives matter so much that remember who we are in Christ, who God is and who God says we are in Jesus. Today, as we close out chapter three, we see one last indicative, one last truth about God. It's actually kind of a a two parter, though, because we're going to focus on the strength that he gives us. And that strength comes through his love. We're going to see today is that God gives strength to us through his love and that the power source for all obedience. The power source to live out everything we're about to see in the coming weeks in chapters four through six. Some of the things we've already been called to. In chapters one through three, that power source is the gospel, particularly the love of God. I want us to get this today. The strength required for the Christian life is not found in us. You got to know that going into the next three chapters. The strength required for the Christian life is not found in us. There's actually something freeing about knowing that, but instead it is rooted and grounded in the abundant power of God's multidimensional love for us. And his love is multidimensional. And his strength flows through his love. We'll see that today. Paul's going to pray again. He did this in chapter one. He closed out chapter one with a prayer. This is another prayer that he prays for the children of God, particularly the saints at the church at Ephesus. But it's a prayer for us as well. And spoiler alert, one of the applications for us again, just like it was in chapter one, is that we would pray for each other. This is a good template So pay attention as we go through this. This It's a good way to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a good way to pray for Mercy Village Church. Paul starts in verse 14 through 17, talking about the origin of our strength, our strength to live out what comes in chapters four through six. It has an origin, and that origin is the triune God of the universe. And he highlights every member of the Trinity. Starting in verses 14 and 15, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. For this reason, right, because of everything that's come before and also everything that's yet to come in the book of Ephesians. Everything you've learned that is true about you in Christ for that reason and for the reason of what you're being called to in the future, in the rest of this letter, I bow my knees before the Father. And then he tells us something about the Father. He says, the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. There's a lot of different understandings of that verse, actually. It it might not seem that complicated on at face value, but people ask, what's that mean? Like every family on heaven and on earth is... People have a lot of questions, like scholars do. I, I try not to have... Too many questions. I try to get to the simplest explanation, and and it's this. Our God, our Father, is the God of all peoples, right? If, If you think every tribe and tongue and nation, one day is the promise of revelation, there will be people from every tribe and tongue and nation. That's the promise of Scripture, worshiping God in heaven. So if you think of tribes and tongues and nations as families, then there will be representation from all the families of the earth. He's the God of all peoples. And not just all people today, but all people past, present, and future. So all the families that are in heaven, right? There's those who have died and gone before us. There are those of us now. There are those who come after us. This is who he prays to. The God of all peoples, past, present, and future. And he prays, verse 16, That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant what he's about to pray for. Not according to our bank accounts, not according to our storehouses of talents and gifts, but according to God's. And that's good news, too. 
because we don't have what it takes in and of ourselves. But we're banking on someone far more rich, infinitely more rich than us. According to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being. That's the Holy Spirit. Remember, I said the Trinity is the origin, God, the father, and God, the Holy Spirit, God, the son of our strength to live like Jesus. So here he cites the Holy Spirit. We actually had this as the core value we talked about at the very beginning of our gathering today. One of the things we say here at Mercy Village Church, we like to remind ourselves of at Mercy Village Church is that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And because of that, now we can go outward boldly. We can live in obedience to Christ. We can proclaim the message of Christ because we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. He lives within us, right? And when Jesus... Jesus left. He said, actually, it's going to be better for you that I'm leaving. So because the one who comes after me, right? So Jesus is about to ascend back into heaven after his ministry. He says, the one who will come after me, the helper, the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity will teach you new things, right? Open your eyes to new things about Jesus that you didn't know before and remind you of all the stuff I've already taught you. So the Holy Spirit moves and still today moves amongst the people of God opening our eyes again and again and again, right? And it manifests itself in different ways. Like for some of you, when the truth about uh, Jesus is revealed, maybe through a song or there's maybe tears well up in your eyes, maybe plans start to spin around in your head about how this ministry can impact these people. Maybe you feel led to raise your hands or to to bow your knees in prayer or whatever the working is, but it's it's the Holy Spirit. Revealing to us the truth about Jesus. He's at work. And that strength, any hope we have of strength to obey and walk in the ways of Jesus must come through the Holy Spirit. There's one more member of the Trinity. He gets pointed to in verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. God the Father. God the Holy Spirit. God the Son. Jesus. Does Jesus dwell in you would be my question today. Are you a Christian? That's a weird way to talk (laughs) that Jesus would live inside of you. I get it. (laughs) If you ask Jesus into your heart, right? Like that's the way the preacher would say it. Sounds kind of strange. That's a spiritual reality, obviously not a physical reality. Is the spirit of Christ in you by grace through faith and Ephesians chapter 2, that was the message. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of works so that no one may boast. Have you put your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross? If so, then Christ is in you. Spiritual reality. The Spirit of Christ is in you. So what does that mean? If you're a child of God and the Spirit is in you... It's pretty exciting. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If you're a child of God, you're not in the flesh, right? Like your main predominant bend in life is not to do what the flesh desires. You're still tempted by that. Trust me, I know. I know you guys and you know me. We're still tempted to, to live in accordance to our fleshly desires. But we're new people. The spirit is in us. And if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you. Although the body is dead because of sin, right? Like, although there's still a part of you that desires to to do things that that are not of God. Although the body is dead because of sin. The spirit is life because of righteousness. And get this, verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If Christ is in you, death defeating, resurrection power. You see why I pray, God, what we know not, please teach us. Because If we were a people who believed that the power that raised Jesus from the dead was at work in us. The lives we would lead, right? 
would be very distinctive. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in me. Is at work in you if you are a child of God. Resurrection strength is in you, saints, today. That's the origin of our strength. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the triune God is the origin of our strength. It's not found in us. It's found inexhaustibly in everything that is our triune God. So now Paul reasons, if God is the origin of our strength, then the fuel for our strength is His love. If our strength originates from God, then the, then the fuel that ignites that strength in us is love. Starting in the second half of verse 17. That you, saints, that you, church, that you, children of God, being rooted and grounded in love. I love these two analogies. First one's agricultural. Rooted. I don't know if you know anything about aspen trees. <laughs> My friend Carolyn taught me about them. Aspen trees have a shared root system underneath the ground. They have these, these stands of aspen trees, these groups of aspen trees. And when an aspen tree gets sick or diseased, I don't know how this happens, except God's good grace, the aspen trees, through that intertwined root system, will send nutrients to the sick trees. Isn't that nuts? It's nuts. That's the church. Rooted and grounded in love. All of us together sharing that amongst ourselves with one another. Rooted agricultural example. The next example is the next word is grounded. It's a building term founded or established. The Bible says Jesus says the wise man builds his house on the rock, the firm foundation. I'm about to show a a video here in a second. I want to tell you what it is before we do. I saw this last night. I mean, just absolutely wrecked me. This is Ukraine days right before the Russians are like standing on the precipice of, of trying to take over Kiev. And we've sang this song before is why it it struck me. He will hold me fast. You can see the lyrics there. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He will hold me fast. And he says, for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. Listen to them. Just listen. Watch the way he smiles at this day. Watch Those are people who have built their house on the rock. They are rooted and grounded in love that is untouchable. That is your brothers and sisters in Christ. In the face, stuff we honestly can't comprehend. And that's a gift too. I'm not dogging us for that. We are where we are. They are where they are. Their walk with Christ looks a certain way. Ours looks a certain way. But be honest, we can't comprehend But in the face of death, loss, pain, he will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. And and God says to you through Paul that love is yours. The love that they're clinging to right now will be yours when that family member dies. When there's that cancer diagnosis. When there's that loss of a job, when there's that uncertainty. That's where we build our house. That's where we stay rooted and grounded. 
Paul expands on what we're rooted and grounded in, starting in verse 18. He says, may the straight, may that those who are you being rooted and grounded in love, here's what he's praying for the saints at Ephesus, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. If you will stand in the face of Russian armies, confident in the love of Jesus for your soul, then you must begin to comprehend it four-dimensionally. Think of like a cube, right? The height, the breadth, the length, the depth, right? This four-dimensional understanding of God's love for you. Be rooted and grounded in that love of the triune God. It is a multidimensional love. You learn about it in your life if you pay attention. That when you love the wrong things, there's a voice that woos you. The voice of God, the voice of the Holy Spirit to love the right things. That when you feel that your uh, strength is completely gone, there is a love, right? In that dimension of your life as well, that carries you. You're loved by God multi dimensionally. And he finishes this thought in verse 19, the last half of it, saying that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That's familiar language, too, because in, in chapter 1, he, he told us that the church is the fullness of him who fills all in all. We've talked even last week, as, re, as recently as last week, about those verses. That the church has the opportunity to be the fullness of God to the world around us. We display the very fullness of God when we love one another, when we serve one another, when we show up in the community, when we show up for others in difficult times, when we show patience, love, etc., etc. We display the fullness of God. But if you will display the fullness of God, if I will display the fullness of God, if I'm ever to actually be a person that when someone looks at me, they say, I see Jesus in him. I see the fullness of God in him. Then we must be rooted and grounded in God's love. But then the question comes and and Paul predicts it, I think, in our hearts. Well, is there enough right rooted and grounded in God, rooted and grounded in his love? Is there enough for all of us? Is there enough? For the situations and and circumstances that I face. In verse 20, Paul says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Literally, the abundant, far, far more power of God. There's no limit to God's love for you. It can't be measured. (laughs) Like this isn't like Jesus loves me, this I know. It is Jesus loves me, this I know. But it's way bigger than Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This is not simply a Sunday school lesson. This is a reality that, that should press into the very depths of our soul. God's love for you can't be measured. Can't be measured in size. Can't be measured in inches. It can't be measured in feet. It can't even be measured in miles or light years. It can't be measured. It is so big, so substantial that it can't be measured in size. It can't be measured in endurance. You can't measure God's love in seconds or minutes or hours or days or weeks or centuries, or millenniums. It's inexhaustible. It can't be measured in space and time. It, it can't even be imagined. The greatest thinkers in the world could not imagine the fullness of God's love for you. Michelangelo doesn't have a clue. The Apostle Paul doesn't have a clue. Einstein, Disney, Emerson, Shakespeare, David the Psalmist, Confucius, Edison, Jobs, Da Vinci, Newton, Darwin, Tyson, Musk, nobody. 
can fathom or imagine the depths of God's love. There's no limit to his love. It can't be overextended. Hear me today, right? Checks written in the name of God's love will never bounce. His love cannot be overdrafted. His love cannot be overextended. His love cannot be outrequested. It's not a milkshake that, right, the saddest sound you ever heard when you're slurping at the very end of that thing. It never runs out. There's no limit. There's no supply chain issues with the love of God. There's no supply and demand considerations with the love of God. No exhaustion, no sabbaticals, no sleeping for the love of God. There's no Mondays off, right? You're wanting to go eat at a restaurant and you're like super excited about it. And then you realize, oh, they're closed on Monday. Love of God never closes. No union strikes, no limit. I can't make you believe that. I can't even make myself believe that. But I want us to. That the immeasurable unimaginable, inexhaustible love of God, His power and strength is at work, as Paul says in verse 20, within you, child of God. And so obviously verse 21 says to Him, right? The fountain of immeasurable, inexhaustible love, the the fuel of love to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You see, there's strength for today, child of God, as the old hymn says, and there's bright hope for tomorrow. And that strength has its origination in our triune God, and it is fueled by his love, and it is abundant beyond imagination. And today, if you're not a Christian, it can be yours. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no man than this, but to lay down his life for his friends. That's human love. We're told that Jesus dies for us while we're still sinners, while we're enemies to him. The greatest a human can do is lay his life down for his friends. The savior of our lives lays his life down for his enemies so that we can be saved. In John 3.16, that famous verse, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have ever lasting life that can be your reality today believe on the lord jesus christ and you'll be saved if you have any questions about what that means what that looks like talk to me talk to pastor josh we'd love to answer those questions child of god though two things for us as we close first tap into this source of strength our strength for obedience for living like jesus for everything that's coming in the next Three chapters is rooted in God's love for us. So tap into that strength. God loves you. That's the reality of it. Believe it. And the best place to practice believing it is among this body of believers. Being amongst this body of believers matters because it is in this place that we link arms with other people who deeply believe in the love of God and are exhorting one another and encouraging one another of that reality so that we can rest in it. Back to the aspen trees one last time. These are the words of my dear friend and a leader among among us, Carolyn Canini. She says uh, aspen stands, she did her own research, (laughs) aspen stands are beautiful Strong and connected. Think of this in means of the church. They flourish at high altitudes where they are one of the only trees that change with the seasons, which makes them stand out like gold bands. They share a root system and all the spiritual applications of that are are intact. When one is sick, the, the community sends nutrients to the sick one through their vast underground root system. Some people even call them quaking aspens or trembling aspens because of the beautiful way the wind moves through a stand of them. It reminds me of all the things Christian community can be. Commitment, community, shared root system, love, but also times of betrayal and pain. But in that beauty and prayer and hard work and trembling together, forgiveness and grace. 
Might we be a place that's rooted in the love of God like that? That shared, may that be our shared root system. The love of God. So that when we stand tall, right, in the storms, it's not in our own power and strength. It's rooted, grounded in the love of God. That we can stand down anything that way. And the final application is this, and I warned you it was coming. Pray for one another like this. This is a prayer that we just went through. So I would challenge you this week, just as a, as a little homework assignment, to take that passage, read through it, and pray those things for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray that way for them. And lastly, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I don't think we can hear it too much. God loves you. You seen that uh, Goodwill Hunting movie? Where he's like got that scene with Robin Williams and Matt Damon, and Robin Williams is like, "It's not your fault." And Matt Damon's like, "Yeah, I know, I know, it's not my fault. I know." He's like, "No, it's it's not your fault." He's like, yeah, I know, it's not my fault. Yeah. It's not your fault. Yeah. I... And then it finally hits Matt Damon and he breaks down in tears, right? Because he finally gets it. Yeah, it's not my fault. I feel like with God's love for me, I need somebody like standing over me telling me God loves you. Right? God loves you. Yeah, I know. I, I learned that in preschool, Sunday school class. No, God loves you. Oh, I know. I sing about it every Sunday in church. No, God loves you. Do you believe it? Like really believe it? God loves you. And that love is immeasurable, unimaginable, inexhaustible. And it's yours in Jesus. When your father looks at you, he looks at you with love that you can't imagine. When your father looks at you, he he looks at you with love that can't be exhausted. When your father looks at you, he looks at you with love that is inimaginable. And tapped into that strength of God's love, nothing can stand against us. The armies of Russia can't stand against the church that knows God loves them like that. COVID can't stand against the church that knows God loves them like that. A cancer diagnosis can't stand against people who know God loves them like that. Loss of a job. Suffering. Fear. It can't stand against the people who know God loves them. And when it gets hard to walk in Christ's likeness, the strength to continue is found only there. The strength required for the Christian life is it's not found in us. It is rooted and grounded in the abundant power of God's multidimensional love for us. All I can do is say it. Only the Holy Spirit can make us believe it. All I can do is lift this book up and show you that it says that. But it's the Holy Spirit that has to make me believe it. And it's the Holy Spirit that has to make you believe it. Might he make us believe it. Father, thank you so much that you love us like that. Love beyond our comprehension, love beyond our ability to understand. Give us faith to believe it. Give us hearts overwhelmed by the beauty of it. So that in the difficult times, so that when we seek to walk in obedience to you, and it's not always easy, that we won't try to look within ourselves for the strength and the power to do it, that we'll rest in your love for us. That we will see your gaze upon us as it truly is, a loving Father, gentle and lowly in heart. And we can come to you, yoke up with you, find rest for our souls. Give us that. It's in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to this feed wherever you listen to podcasts. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. And we'd love for you to experience what God is doing as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. 
connect with us online at www.mercyvillage.church.